terrifically exciting. So last but not least, Vandita from, from BHP, uh, we're going to talk about two different things. First, I want to talk about the work that BHP is doing in steel and shipping. We know steel is around, steel making is about 8% of uh, global GHG emissions, shipping 2 to 3% of GHG emissions. Given BHP's position as I think the world's largest dry bulk charterer, BHP sort of sits in this nexus of, of challenges, but also opportunities to, to move the needle, really, in, 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 a, in a way that's a sort of a process innovation. So maybe help us understand the way that you're working with your clients to reduce the carbon intensity of, of steel making in a hard to abate sector. Uh, sure, David. Uh, as, as you said, steel is a very important sector, uh, not only for the traditional what we would think of as building blocks of our civilization and development, which has always been the case, but equally uh, to enable decarbonization of the world. Mm -hmm. Energy transition requires a lot of infrastructure, and most of it is based on steel. So uh, as the world's largest natural resources company, where our inputs go into steel making, uh, what happens with steel is really critical yep. to BHP. Uh, secondly, I think uh, when I talk about decarbonization, just to put things in perspective of how important this sector, which is carbon intensive, as yep. you said, is that we have done a modeling of one and a half degree world of what steel demand needs to be in one and a half degree world. And for that, next 30 years, uh, demand for steel will be 1.8 times almost, almost two, so 1.8 times the demand of steel in last 30 years. Mm. So next 30 is 1.8 times compared to last 30 years wow. in one and a half degree world technical scenario. Now, if that's the case, then the point is, how do we go on the journey for yep. decarbonization? And here, it's really critical to um, acknowledge that there are going to be different phases in which steel industry can uh, decarbonize. And that varies from region to region based on lots of factors, based on starting point of efficiency of uh, processes, based on how old the capital stock is in that particular region. In, in this region, in Asia, in China, for example, yeah. uh, the, the steel mills are, um, are around, uh, uh, you know, uh, very young, uh, yep. 18 yep. odd uh, years. Uh, in India, in, in China, 12 years, versus an average age of steel mill in Europe, which is 40 years. So it will come up for renewal much, yeah. much uh, sooner including policy um, considerations, et cetera. So the way we think about steel transition into a zero emission kind of industry is three phases. One is optimization of current processes and inputs to reduce the first plot of emissions, which we think can be, can be up to 20 odd percent, 20 to 30 percent. Then there is a nirvana stage, which is the end state, when everything is green, energy-based, and maybe uh, hydrogen-based, or uh, uh, some of the other electrolysis early um, stage technology. But because that's going to take time, we do need to acknowledge and transition stage to make yep. that shift. And what we are doing is, uh, given we are upstream, really starting to partner with our customers to make that change. We should not continue to wait and not do any action today, which can actually reduce emissions by 50, 60, or more percent. And in that, uh, what we have done is, uh, since the uh, last 18 months or so, partnered with uh, some of our largest customers in this region, for example, uh, China Bau and HBase from Japan, uh, from China, uh, JFE from Japan, POSCO from uh, South Korea, uh, to look at uh, what could be the technologies which, can, which have the ability to reduce emissions upwards of 30% and can be scaled uh, post 2030. Now, uh, just to put scale in perspective, between these four uh, steel mills, the world's production capacity between these four is 12%. So we are partnering with 12% of uh, production capacity of steel between these four uh, mega companies. And just to, again, give a perspective, all of Europe's, all of Europe's steel production is around 8 to 9% of world's production. So it's, 
It's that massive. And the kind of technologies we are uh, partnering and funding uh, include um, uh, injection of hydrogen or oxygen to reduce the carbon uh, footprint. Looking at uh, hydrogen-based uh, DRI processes. Yep. Uh, looking at uh, 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 flag and how that can reduce. So the point is, for steel making, there isn't a silver bullet. Yep, yep. And we don't wait for the perfect answer. So we experiment and start to look at innovative partnerships to fund different commercializations and piloting of technologies, which can all get scaled up, or some of them can get scaled up uh, through this decade. One question that we've got from the audience, but which I wanted to ask as well as an analyst, is for, for green steel, what is the revenue opportunity for your clients? Do you think we'll see a pricing disparity between green and quote unquote green and quote unquote brown steel, or will it still just remain as a cost for your clients to do this? Yeah, I think uh, for green steel, first to see what conditions are needed for the green steel banner to be the right ones. And the conditions there include abundant and at scale renewable energy, because it's an energy intensive part. Secondly, not only the energy needs to be right, we need to get into the hydrogen or get into some of the technologies which are not yet scaled. And then the infrastructure to enable that. And as I was saying, from from region to region, the path to that green state will be different, mm -hmm. where some will uh, sprint away and some will take more time to do so. And I think uh, what is important from a cost perspective is we think of it to get to that uh, green steel, this is trillions of investment required, mm -hmm. yep. trillions. Uh, and when, the, when that is a consideration, then the issue is what kind of demand signals all the way from the end users are coming yep. to enable that investment to happen at pace and at innovation level that we are looking at. So I would say uh, some time to go, but those demand signals need to continue to get strengthened. But equally, we need to continue with like-minded ecosystem players, uh, continue to look at all these technologies which have uh, different ways of reducing emissions quickly uh, rather than look for just the perfect answer. I appreciate that. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about blockchain because I feel young and cool when I talk about blockchain. But to your earlier comments around the need for uh, metals and minerals in energy transition, obviously there's a huge need for copper and nickel and so on and so forth. But also at the same time, questions around traceability of metals and minerals, you know, cobalt is one good example. Blockchain is often mooted as something that will, will reach this nirvana, to use uh, your words. Tell me about the work that you're doing to, to, to pilot the use of blockchain in, in supply chains. Indeed, I think uh, very important, and there's a real pull for customers to know where the metals are coming from, because these uh, supply chains need to be robust, traceable, provenance created, uh, not just for carbon emission, but for other ethical considerations as well. And in that respect, we've done uh, quite a few uh, already executed transactions, to, to name a few. Uh, for copper, out of our Chilean uh, mines, uh, we have done uh, a, a blockchain traceability um, right from the mine to the delivery to Southwire, which is one of the largest uh, wire makers in the US, um, tracing the carbon emissions, mm. and off the back of it, actually uh, uh, using some of the carbon offsets and carbon credit, created world's first uh, carbon neutral copper cargo, mm. which is really an exciting uh, uh, development. Uh, to give you another example, Tesla is one of our big clients, uh, given that we um, supplied nickel mm -hmm. to Tesla. And again, the provenance and the uh, carbon emission uh, is so critical to ensure what it is. So BHP has some of the world's lowest carbon emission intensity mines for nickel. So we partnered with 
uh, Tesla through a blockchain uh, solution. Uh, in fact, we have also um, invested in that company called uh, Circular. Uh, through the blockchain uh, platform, uh, traced the carbon emission as it went through the supply chain mm -hmm. from our mine to the gigafactory yep. of uh, Tesla in Shanghai. And that is the kind of uh, um, innovation which is needed at scale and more players can join. This can set the minimum standards which are acceptable, yep. but equally give cadence to people who can really prove that they have the lowest uh, uh, footprint. So this is not necessarily a, a revenue driver or a pricing driver. This is a, a BAU sort of cost of doing business that if you want to increasingly supply to these kind of manufacturers, In, you'll have to demonstrate I, I think so. It's a market access thing, but equally yeah. going forward, as this becomes the minimum standard, I think for a company like BHP, it becomes very interesting because we believe in our footprint yeah. so our commodities can get sustainability tag as a branding, and that has an implication for uh, price discovery later. Wonderful. I can see the counters turned red, uh, and I'm uh, well aware that I'm sitting between people and lunch, or actually people seem to have started lunch. Uh, so I will just uh, round up here extreme thanks and gratitude to my uh, panelists, Mikhail uh, Van Dieter and Spencer.